Hey guys, and welcome back. Today I'm joined by Michael Saylor. He was listed number four most notable people on, in cryptocurrency by Cointelegraph last year. He's one of the most influential people in the cryptocurrency space. I know you've heard of him, and we've got him on the channel today. I want to talk to him a lot about the problem that Bitcoin is trying to solve of inflation of the US dollar and why Bitcoin might be the best solution that mankind has ever discovered in that direction. Michael, welcome to the channel. How are you doing, sir? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me. That is a beautiful ship behind you. Can you tell me a little bit about the story of that? What's going on with that? Well, I mean, it's it's a model of the ships the Dutch East India Company dispatched to the East Indies back in the 17th century. And that's a handmade model from the 19th century of a 17th century sailing ship, kind of a merchant warship. And so, uh, I don't know, it was given to me as a gift once <laughs> upon a time. And I, I keep it as a reminder of... Um, of uh, the beautiful work that human beings are capable of doing and the intricacy of life. Hmm. That's amazing. I think that's something that we're going to be talking about today is one of those beautiful works called Bitcoin that you in 2013, you, you sent out the tweet, Everybody who interviews you asked about this. I'm not going to make you talk about it again, but you had a tweet in 2013 saying Bitcoin's going to go the way of online gambling. You said in an interview that you don't even remember sending the tweet. It's probably just something you sent. And obviously, you've changed your tune on that because between you and your company, MicroStrategy, you own almost, well, you and MicroStrategy combined own about 140,000 Bitcoin. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's incredible. Yeah, I, th I think of Bitcoin is it's digital energy and it's also digital money and it's digital property, and, and it reflects such a, a profound uh, new idea that unless you spend 10 or 100 hours or more, and unless you have a need to embrace a new idea, you wouldn't really appreciate it and understand it. So if someone just pokes you and says, what's your opinion of it? And you spent half an hour or an hour thinking about it. Normally, you've got a kind of ignorant reaction based upon imperfect models and imperfect understanding. And it's only when you get to the point in your life when you need it and you need to understand it or you're, you know, you have a, a, an inspirational experience that forces you to dig a bit deeper. Do you start to form a more um, nuanced view? Right. I think that's actually a very important part of the adoption of Bitcoin because I want to kind of lay the foundation here. I've talked about on the channel how Bitcoin is, in my opinion, the best solution ever created to one of the biggest problems that we've ever faced. And that is the fact that we don't have control over our own finances. We don't have control over the rate at which our currencies are inflated. We don't have control over the rate at which gold is mined. We don't have control over the rate at which property appreciates as the devaluation of our currency takes place. That is a huge problem because as you've talked about quite a bit, you can't store wealth into the future reliably whatsoever. If you tried to buy a house 100 years ago, it would have been $100,000 and now it's worth 50 million bucks. If you try and store wealth into the future, it's going to be eroded or taken or stolen. And I personally think that Bitcoin is the solution to that. Would you agree that that's one of the biggest problems that we face right now? And if so, is Bitcoin the solution to that problem? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the biggest problem that we face as a civilization is conservation of energy. How, how do I conserve energy over time? And uh, that's, that's the inflation and the degradation problem. Um, the, a, a secondary issue is how do you move energy through space? The transactional problem. That's, that's kind of tactical, but the strategic issue is what's the half-life of your energy? Right? If, I, if I give you um, food in a container and, it, and it's good for like a day, well, you got to eat it in a day. How do you store food for a decade? It's a challenge, right? And if I give you energy and the half-life of the energy is three years, then, then you can only plan with a three-year time horizon. I, mean, I think when you have um, energy in the form of money, right? money is monetary energy, it's economic energy. So if I have economic energy and I'm storing it in a fiat currency that's hyperinflating, that means that the half-life of the energy is one year. If the currency is inflating at the rate of 7% a year, the half-life of the energy is 10 years. If I put that money into gold and gold's inflating at 2% a year, the half-life of the energy is 35 years. If I put the money into a building and the building has a useful life of a hundred years, that's long. I mean, no, no building will probably last a hundred years without serious maintenance, but let's just plug it in just for, the, for grins. Well, you know, so the half-life of the energy is 50 years. 
in 100 years, the building's gone. So what if I wanted the half-life of the energy to be 1,000 years or 10,000 years? Uh, how do I make something last forever? That fundamentally, the real issue in, with the human race is how do I make something last forever? How do I achieve a mortal life? Um, if I want something to, um, uh, to circle uh, the globe forever, I have to put it in orbit. If I get it almost in orbit, it crashes to Earth, right? Yep. Almost in orbit is not in orbit. If I get it in orbit, it'll circulate a circle around the, the world forever. But if I get it out of orbit, if I can reach escape velocity, it'll circle the sun forever. When maybe if I, if I beat the sun's escape velocity, it'll circle you know, a galaxy forever. So how do I conserve energy uh, or, or how do I propagate energy forever? And, and Bitcoin is a solution to this problem. Pro paper money isn't a solution to the problem. Land, land and, and buildings aren't really a good solution. Gold isn't a good solution. And so I, I do think it's the idea that you can capture an, uh, a set of energy and hold it forever, right? Is, uh, is a profound idea. And you can, it, it's not so different than saying, what if I wanted to build a city and I told you that the, um, the rock you're building the city on was only going to sink at one foot a decade. I, it, okay, well, you know, if Venice was sinking at one foot a decade, where does that leave us? Not one foot, a hundred years? It's still a bit of a problem. I mean, you lose two or three feet over 300 years and you're underwater in some places. So I, I really need something that's not gonna deflect. It's, it's not going to move, not one inch in a hundred years, right? And, and if we look at things that advance the human race, steel's an example of a low deflection form of metallic energy. The difference between building a building with steel and building a building with clay or wood, right? Or, you know, fill in the blank, right? Uh, some other material, it's pretty profound. And, um, and, and building a city on granite or schist versus sand or swampland is pretty profound. Building um, an economic system, a company, a country, uh, an institution on Bitcoin, as opposed to on um, Venezuelan boulevards, right? How long is your company gonna last on a currency which is hyperinflating, right? Not five years. How long will your company last built on a currency like the US dollar? You said the US dollar lost 99.5% of its value over 80 years. That doesn't work as a foundation, as a balance sheet. And so Bitcoin is, Bitcoin represents, um, you know, a, a liquid fungible synthetic asset that you can use to build a balance sheet. If you're a family, a company, a country, you can move it anywhere, right? It doesn't degrade right? The maintenance cost is lower than any other form of asset. And if you know that you're building on a firm foundation, you can look out a hundred years or a thousand years. And, uh, you know, that's a profound idea. I think that's very important because like I said, I think that Bitcoin is the first, and you've talked about this many times, how, you know, try and store your money in real estate, 2% property taxes, 50 years is gone, store it in gold, half of it's gone in 35 years. You store it in the US dollar, CPI data has been 2%. That's ridiculous. It's been much higher than that. Recently, you've said that it's been, you know, probably closer to 25, 30%. I completely agree with you. Um, and you've also said that trying to move around from the US dollar to another sovereign currency, another fiat currency to the stock market, to bonds, to precious metals, you're just moving deck, uh, deck chairs around on a sinking ship. What you need to do is get off the ship and get on a new ship like Bitcoin. And I think it's actually very helpful for me as somebody with a history in astrophysics and physics before I decided that I wanted to start this YouTube channel and build a media company, I had wanted to go into astrophysics. So when you use physics uh, de uh, explanations such as orbit and the type of ground that you build on, that's very helpful for me to understand. What are some of the ways that you first came to understand what Bitcoin is and what do you think are the ways that we can help the masses understand what Bitcoin is that'll really resonate with them? You've said that education is the biggest thing that we need to teach people about this Bitcoin <clears throat> paradigm shift. Well, I think um, I think education is key. Um, the way I think about Bitcoin is, is, and it's 
purest form, I think of it as digital energy. And if I look out at the history of the human race and the advance of civilization, I think the civilization was advanced by fire, a form of chemical energy, and it's advanced by uh, water, right? Which is, which is a, a form of gravitational energy when, you, when you're channeling gravity through water. You know, and wind, right? We sail the oceans, wind energy. And, um, and if you look at uh, the conversion of uh, potential energy to kinetic energy in the form of uh, missiles, right? Advanced of civilization, explosives, another, another type of chemical energy, electricity, right? Electromagnetic energy, nuclear energy or atomic energy. Um, all of these forms of energy uh, move us forward as a civilization. If you roll the clock back 120 years and, and you think about the impact of uh, electricity in the society, and you went to everybody that operated a, a town or a hotel or a building or a ship, and you said, this electricity is really gonna have a profound impact on your life. People would have thought, I don't, I don't you know, how do I think about this, right? Is electricity a good thing or a bad thing? Well, will it burn my house down? Will it shock me? Right? A lot of people die right fires take place uh what happens if you have electrical fire on a ship big problem right so uh it probably took people 30 years 40 years before they had had absorbed what electricity meant and uh, and you know you're like well i, I don't want it because it'll be regulated well uh, is regulation of electricity a bad thing or a good thing you know, the, it's a thing, right? I mean, you probably can't roll out electricity throughout a city without some regulation. You, you know, to get a certificate of occupancy on a building, you need to, you know, you need to pass a fire inspection. And part of the fire inspection is make sure that the electric wiring is not going to burn the house down. And so electricity was a, it's a profound idea, how I move energy efficiently, right? Uh, over wires, over copper, using electromagnetic, electromagnetism. But now there's this concept of digital energy and people think, well, what is it? I don't, I, I don't even believe it is. What? Well, I mean, I, I could put a billion dollars, you know, on, on one end of the planet, convert a billion dollars of fiat currency into a billion dollars of Bitcoin, move it to the other end of the planet in an hour and convert it back into Japanese yen and convert that into electricity and electrocute me with it or convert it into you know, mechanical energy or convert it into cars or convert it into buildings, right? A billion dollars moving over a wire becomes whatever you want it to be. And what is energy? Energy is matter, matter is energy. There is conservation of energy. Matter is low frequency energy. You slow down energy and you get steel. You know, you speed it up. I set things on fire, you know, I take a piece of wood, looks like matter. I set it on fire and it becomes light and heat. What happened to the wood, right? All of these are just transformations. And um, the human race really hasn't really had the ability to transform uh, energy into digital form. And once you do it, you realize that it's profound impact on the concept of property. What if I could have digital property? What is property? Property is low frequency money. What is money? Mid-frequency energy. If I, if I have a billion dollars and hold it for 30 years, it's digital property. If I could put it in a building, then it's physical property. I could put it in a Bitcoin, then it's digital property. What if I speed it up a bit and I pay for your coffee with it? Now it's like digital money. What if I speed it up a lot and I do 100,000 transactions a minute with it? Well, it's digital energy, right? What's the difference? Right, they're just they're just different frequencies, vibration frequency, right, of energy moving through a medium, and um, the world uh, doesn't quite understand that yet. And you can't blame everybody for not quite understanding that. The human race had hundreds of thousands of years to figure out fire, right? It, how long did we spend trying to figure out bronze, iron, and steel? A while. How about explosives? <laughs> what could go wrong? We're still learning you know? about those. <laughs> What's the, yeah, what could go wrong a bit? How yeah. long does it take to figure things out? Air power, sea power, sure. land power, nuclear power. 
you know, arguably we still haven't figured out nuclear power, right? Like the Germans shut sure. down their nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. Okay, but on the other hand, the United States won a world war with yep. nuclear power, the right? Fusion's and, been 10 years away for half a century. <laughs> so the human race is moving forward through channeling energy. Bitcoin's just the latest chapter in that story. So what, what if I could take a billion dollars worth of electricity and put it in the palm of my hand, send it anywhere on earth, store it for a hundred years and not lose any of it. That's a pretty profound idea. I think that the, the key to advancing this is examples. We need to build it into technology. Like when Cash App built support for Bitcoin, that was this big step forward. When they built support for Lightning, a second step forward, when Cash App lets you send uh, move one Bitcoin from me to you for free on the Cash Network, that, that's the layer three. It's a third step forward, right? So here's big idea, right? Bitcoin's got eight hundred billion dollars worth of energy on the main net on the level one. You can move that energy um, in minutes for dollars, but when that energy flows to the layer two lightning, you can move that energy in seconds for a penny, pennies, maybe fraction of pennies. And when that energy moves to layer three, Cash App is layer three, Binance is a layer three, Coinbase is a layer three, FTX is a layer three. When it moves to a layer three, you can move that in milliseconds for nothing. And so we're we're now just coming to grips with what does it mean to move energy at the speed of light and how do the layers play into this and and one big idea is high velocity money high velocity energy flexible portable property but the second big idea is um property with a half-life of forever that's a big yeah, idea. That's and huge. Human race has never, what, what's the longest lived property before Bitcoin, right? You say gold, well, gold, you can burn a building and the gold will still be underneath the building. So yeah, it's kind of indestructible in that way. But as property, as an energy container, it's still bleeding at 30, you know, every 35 years is bleeding out under the best of circumstances, half its energy. So the best conceivable idea I think we had is gold. You know, I mean, it's storing my money in a Picasso or in a Leonardo da Vinci painting strikes me as being a bit of a crap, you know, yeah. crap shoot, right? Because what if people don't like Leonardo da Vinci in 500 years? So, so coming up with a way to store economic energy for a hundred years or a thousand years is a challenge. And, what if I told you, right, the hu human race, the longest we ever managed to get anything to live economically was 35 years. And now we just came up with this thing that has a theoretical life of forever. It's like that, that that's a singularity, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like the world before oil and after oil. You ever try to, you know, try to row a boat across the Atlantic. <laughs> Okay, and then compare that to uh, a ship with a sail. That was a pretty big step change, right? Uh, from mechanical power to sail power. Now, uh, that ship with the sail was six to 12 week journey and then replace that with a ship with a diesel engine, right? And, and you tell me whether you like that or not, but of course you probably would like liquid energy or chemical energy in liquid form. And now, you know, when you flip that uh, to um, a nuclear powered aircraft carrier becomes different again. And so we're, we're stepping through energy paradigms and each paradigm is uh, order of magnitude or orders of magnitude more powerful than the previous paradigm. And ultimately the challenge is how do you get the society to adopt the paradigm shift I mean, the definition of a paradigm is it's it's so unexpected that people can't even conceive it exists. So, of course, they don't choose to spend the time to understand what it is. 
because they reject it reflexively mm -hmm. out of hand as an impossibility or they diminish it as, oh, it's tulips. You know, it's like the, it's just a bunch of tulip bulbs or it's a speculative thing because they're not looking for digital energy that lasts forever, that moves at the speed of light in milliseconds, right? They're not looking for it probably because they don't even understand. A lot of times people don't understand the distinction of, of matter and energy as it relates to economics. They don't understand that money is energy. If you don't think money is energy, then you don't think property is low frequency money. So as soon as you see money as energy, and I'd say two thirds of the people on Twitter or two thirds of the people that I track, they don't, you know, they don't really get the idea of digital energy because just in their mind, yeah. they're just prejudiced against the idea. They're, you know what they say? They go, oh, it's not digital energy because it doesn't generate electricity on the other end. It's like, <laughs> but these are the same people that don't really think about what is the definition of digital music. Like if I give you an MP3 file or I give you an MP4 file, is it digital music if there's no speaker? Mm -hmm. Sure it is. It's a file that has, uh, has a song on it. Okay, but, but, but how does it become music? Well, I have to send it over a network to a computer to decode it. And then I have to plug it into a speaker, which is electrified and it becomes digital music. The file is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Take away the internet, take away electricity, take away the speaker, take away the computers. Is the MP3 file still Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? Yeah, I mean, I suppose if you obliterate every computer on the planet and you obliterate the internet and you obliterate every power source, then you won't be able to hear Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But the file still got the music encoded on it. And the same is true with um, the metaphor holds for digital books, digital maps, digital energy. Right. If I if I give you a map of a Google map, but you don't have an iPad or a monitor, is it a map? Sure, it is. You just need the right decoding device. You need a decoder chip with a monitor with some electricity, and then it becomes a map for you. Okay. So, but you you know people would say, well, it's not real. Google Maps is not really a digital map because you need electricity on the other end to decode it. Well, yeah. So let's come back to digital energy. Is a Bitcoin digital energy? Well, if I send it to you and you're in Tokyo, what does it take for you to convert it back into electricity? Just to, all you got to do is run it through your computer, plug it into a local fiat exchange, exchange it for yen and buy yourself some kilowatt hours and it becomes electricity. But maybe you don't want electricity. Maybe you want fire. You could buy some coal and you can set it afire. Maybe you want oil. Maybe you want it in low frequency form. So you turn it into a building. Is it energy? Sure, it's energy. Why? Because Satoshi solved the double spin problem. And the double spin problem is a very lowbrow colloquial phrase that equates to the highbrow conservation of energy, right? The solution of the double spin problem is the solution of implementing conservation of energy in cyberspace. Yep. Yep. And at the point that you implemented conservation of energy in cyberspace, you converted the file from holding digital information, mm -hmm. which is non-conservative, yep. to holding digital energy, which is conservative, right? Messages, maps, music are information and they're non-conservative. And that was the first instantiation of the internet. But what Bitcoin delivers us is digital property, digital matter, digital energy, things that are conservative in cyberspace, things that if I transfer a billion dollars from me to you, I can't have it. And now you do have it. And, and that is the magic of the solving the double spend problem. And that is the big paradigm shift. You could say, well, Bitcoin represents the singularity where we introduce conservation of energy to cyberspace. And that's a pretty profound idea now, uh, we haven't just figured out how to conserve energy forever. We've, we've figured out how to transfer energy through space with negligible friction. And finally, we figured out how to introduce matter and energy. And matter is energy, right? Matter mm -hmm. is low yep. frequency. A equals MC we squared. figured out how to introduce matter into cyberspace. Mm -hmm. 
right? Which is which means that now as you move through cyberspace, you can literally get killed. You can <laughs> you can. Right. The, the problem in cyberspace today is I can launch 10 million denial of service attacks on your website at de minimis cost. There's not really a price to pay. But what if each one of those uh, avatars was wrapped in $20 of digital energy and I launched it 10 million times and now it cost me $200 million to attack you for an hour? Right now, now you can go bankrupt in cyberspace screwing around. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are, there are consequences. And so what I'd say is we're introducing truth and consequence into cyberspace. And that is also profound because that lays the foundation for us to create beautiful, safe, elegant, uh, artistic products in cyberspace. Because right now, what we have is a bunch of garbage, you know, on the social networks, Twitter and Instagram and YouTube yep. and LinkedIn. They're just full of spam and phishing attacks and scammers. And like how garbage. you'll give somebody two Bitcoin back if they give you one Bitcoin. It, that's a scam, obviously. But you know what? And and a thousand Michael Saylor bots offering to do that <laughs> spin up every week, yep. you know, like one every like 10 minutes. Yep. They do it to and me, too. Know, yeah. And they're winning because. We report them every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I spend a million dollars a year reporting them. Wow. And they Good. just have a little Python script that just keeps spinning them up. So you, you really can't fight that. Are you, what I would say is the reason the real world works is because if I walk into a hotel room in the real world, they normally ask for a credit card. And if I smash up the hotel room, they charge my credit card. Now, if they let me walk in the hotel room and didn't take a credit card, I might still, I might be more likely to smash up the hotel room, but there still might be a criminal or physical risk. Maybe somebody would see me come out of the hotel and beat me up, or maybe I get arrested or be bad for my reputation. So it's still not easy. What happens if I actually could make a billion clones of myself, go into every hotel room every hour and smash them all up for free with no consequence? Like that, there's no hotel industry, right? <laughs> now, what, what keeps me, what keeps me from doing that, right? And the answer is one, uh, economic deterrent when the hotel operator asks for the credit card, but two, there is conservation of energy in the real space, in Newtonian space. I can't physically be in a million places at the same time, right? I can't move at the speed of light. Too much friction, right? Shock waves. I burn myself up. I can't do it. And so the real world has things of beauty and functionality because there is conservation of energy and because there are consequences, either political or economic consequences. Cyberspace is without truth. It's without consequences. There is no conservation of energy absent Bitcoin. And that's why all these products right, are, are crippled and impaired. And the solution to cleaning up cyberspace and the solution to creating beautiful products in cyberspace is to introduce conservation of energy. And to do that, you need digital money, digital property, but, but mostly you need digital energy. You need the ability to wrap your avatar uh, in a layer of digital energy so that if you click through 10,000 things a day or 100,000 things a day, as long as you're a decent, uh, well-mannered cyber citizen, you move friction free. But if you go and attempt to smash up someone's website a million times a day, there should be a penalty. Mm -hmm. If you attempt to accost or victimize or abuse or harass a million people an hour, there should be a penalty. And when there is, we will be monetizing uh, malice. Mm -hmm. and malicious behavior will be degraded uh, by 99.99% most likely. And, that, and that will be a, a beautiful world. <clears throat> Truth and consequence in cyberspace. That, that's, that's the here and now opportunity slash imperative. It's the technology imperative for Bitcoin. And, it, you know, 
sure, I want to live forever, or I want my money to live forever, but that's a thousand years out. I would like for things to be beautiful and safe and functional now. And that's also a useful application of digital energy. So that's something I've been talking about for a very long time, that Bitcoin solves the problem of not having scarcity online. Before, you could just take a JPEG and copy it 100 million times, and it costs you nothing. And of course, as you talked about, that makes attacking anything much more easy because you don't have to build tanks and bombs and all these things to go and attack somebody. You can just write a Python script, as you said, to do that. And But until I started studying you and watching what you had said, I had never connected the dots that what Bitcoin essentially is, is the first example of a superconducting thermodynamically sound system built online. It's it's a digitally sound system that doesn't leak and erode energy that can be transacted frictionless. But if it is truly a thermodynamically sound system, meaning that its energy cannot be created nor destroyed, well, it can be created. It was initially creation after the initial creation. Its creation process can't change, perhaps we should say. If it truly is a thermodynamically sound system, then that means that its energy cannot be created. So that $800 billion worth of economic energy that has come into Bitcoin had to come from somewhere. So people always ask, where does Bitcoin get its value from? People will often compare Bitcoin to Tulip Mania, as you referenced, or a Picasso painting that people could fall out of favor with. What do you say to the people that say, well, one, where did Bitcoin's economic energy come from in the first place? And two, what happens if people decide... We don't want this economic energy anymore, and they stop using it. Uh, the, the energy is flowing from people that adopt Bitcoin as a store of value. So if uh, 100 people put a billion dollars each into the network by buying the Bitcoin, they're putting $100 billion of economic energy into the network. If you put a trillion dollars of economic energy into the network, then, then that's... Uh, that's the capacity. Yeah, think of it as a battery and you're pumping energy into the battery. Now, let's, let's, pick, a, let's pick a mechanical uh, example, a water tower. Hmm. Okay, I create a water tower in the middle of the city and the water tower has a thousand gallons capacity, but there's no water in it. Okay, so at the bottom of the water tower, maybe is a, is a bicycle. And if I ride the bicycle, it turns on the pump and I pump water up to the top of the tower. So I'm doing work to pump water to the tower. Now, how much energy is the tower holding? Well, depends on how much water you pumped into the tower, right? Hmm. Okay, if the tower's got a thousand gallons of water in it, right? How much energy is that? Well, you measure, you, know, you measure the weight of the water and the height of the tower. Right, and then you calculate the potential energy, and how do you tap into that energy? Well, you turn it the other way, and you you open the gate, and the water flows down, and now you've got you can do work, right? You've got energy, and you oh. can do work. So, what if I have a dam and it can hold ten million gallons? How'd the energy get there? Well, I mean, it's, with the dam, generally the idea is we hope that uh, the sun shines, it evaporates the water. The clouds rain water down on the mountains. The water flows down the mountain to the dam, right? We let nature or the sun do the work, right? Because it's not so easy for us to haul the water up the mountain, right? But a dam is also holding a huge amount of potential energy. So Bit Bitcoin represents, uh, I think of it like, uh, it's like an aqueduct dam type system. I have a dam or a reservoir and I have a set of pipes. How much energy is in the system? Well, none if there's no water in the system. What's the cost to build the dam and the, and the pipes, right? When, when the Romans built the aqueduct system, right? They probably had a dam and they probably had aqueducts. There's a cost to build it. That's a fixed cost. Then there's a cost to maintain it. Now, how much energy can you channel with it? Well, you know, plus or minus a factor of 10 or a factor of 100, right? Probably... <laughs> probably orders of magnitude difference is the amount of energy. Now, what, what's the equivalent here? Well, Bitcoin miners, right? The Bitcoin mining system is, is in essence, it's, it's the fixed and the variable cost to maintain the system. And today, probably four or five billion dollars a year is going into Bitcoin mining. If, if you consider the energy that flows into in this case, the money that goes into buying energy and the money that goes into buying mining rigs, right? That, that's the maintenance cost of the system. 
And then how much economic energy can it move? And the answer is, you know, it could move the 800 billion and it could store 800 billion. I think there's two numbers of interest, right? There's how much is it storing? We know that number, about 800 billion. And then it's how much is moving, right? That's the transaction amount on the L1 yeah. blockchain. And that's more than 800 billion a year, I think. So could I actually put 8 trillion on it? Yeah, sure. You could put 8 trillion on it as easy as 800 billion. Could I put 80 billion on it? Yeah. So what determines how much economic energy is in the system? Well, you know, if the US government decides to buy $100 billion of Bitcoin, right, then probably the value of Bitcoin is going to be squeezed up. Now you, and the, and the potential energy in the system is much higher. Um, you see that potential energy in a bow when you pull the, the bow back or the string back on the bow. How about compressed air? If you look at the, you know, at the engineering of compressed air canisters. Okay, I give you a scuba tank. Well, how much energy is in it? Well, it depends on whether I filled it up or not, right? Like, yeah. right? I mean, hmm. it's a tank, right? It's, it's oh. got some amount of compressed air. Is it one atmosphere? One atmosphere isn't that useful unless you're in outer space when it becomes somewhat useful. But what if it's 10 atmospheres? What if it's 100 atmospheres? Right? Is 100 atmospheres worth of uh, air in a bottle more energy than one atmosphere of air in a bottle? Yeah. How'd it get there? You pumped it in, right? What's, you ever try to create a 100 atmosphere air bottle with balsa wood as the container? <laughs> How about glass, right? How about cloth? How about fill in the blank, clay? Why didn't we do it with clay or balsa wood? It's too fragile. Because we didn't have the right material. Yep. Steel? Steel was a better material. Now, how do I pump $10 trillion of monetary energy into something? Well, I need, a, a, a call it a, a crypto crucible, right? Hmm. A crypto container. What is Bitcoin? It's a crypto container. What are the other containers for money? A uh, metallic container in the form of gold. But the problem with gold is it's not a closed system, it's an open system, right? If, if, if uh, I could, I got 6 billion ounces of gold in the world and we keep adding 2% more a year, but if I've only got 21 million ounces of gold in the world and you could never make any more, then it would be a better container but no one's come up with um, a physical commodity, which is hard capped. We can't figure it out. So gold's not a very good monetary crucible. What about, uh, what about fiat currency? Well, you know, the best one in the world was the dollar and it lost 99.5% of its energy over 80 years. So not that good. What, what's the theoretical best one? You know, well, if God comes down from heaven above and creates this perfect ledger and God said there's 21 million tokens and, I'm, and God's going to keep track of it and God is incorruptible and no one can get to God and subpoena God to double the token supply. And if God makes the ledger, ledger uh, available to everybody on earth and make sure that whenever I give you two, I get debited two, then you've got a perfect monetary container, right? A perfect ledger. But since uh, God's not interested in running our money supply for us, then what's the next best idea? The next best idea is a software system, but it can't be a centralized software system because centralized software systems are corruptible by companies, by programmers, or by government. So it has to be a completely decentralized system. It's the decentralized system that makes it incorruptible and so Bitcoin is that approximation of a perfect monetary crucible every 10 minutes clicking forward, you know, running across millions of computers in the form of Bitcoin miners and 10, 20, 50, 100,000 nodes as ledgers. But the way to think of it really is there's millions and millions of computers that are all keeping each other in check. It's a cybernetic system in homeostasis right in dynamic equilibrium it tends to it, it tends to stabilize itself maybe the most beautiful thing that could be said is uh bitcoin is a perfect machine composed of imperfect parts mm. 
I've heard you talk about that with watchmaking, about how you take two imperfect pieces and then you bring them together to make a perfect watch that'll maintain nearly perfect time anyway. That's really, really interesting. I've got a background. I've got a, you know, I never went to college for it. I've never studied it, you know, professionally, but I do have a lot of, uh, nerdy hours on YouTube studying physics over the last 10 years or so. And it's very interesting to me that in the last five years I've been in crypto, I've never thought about Bitcoin as a water tower or a dam or a container, but that's such a elegant solution to explaining what Bitcoin is. It's just the first container that doesn't leak. It, it doesn't leak. It doesn't leak economic energy in the same way that gold or property or stocks and bonds and the oil market does. It's the first container that does that. But let's pivot a little bit. I want to be respectful of your time. We'll go for just a little bit more here. I want to ask you one more question that's a little more topical. I'm sure you saw it because you keep very close tabs on the Fed and the FOMC meetings and Jerome Powell and everything. You probably saw that they just raised uh, the interest rates, the federal funds rate by 0.25%, 25 basis points yesterday uh, at the time of recording this. We're recording this on the 17th of March. What do you think rising interest rates are going to do to the Bitcoin market? And what do you think the relationship between the interest rates and the inflation of the US dollar and Bitcoin is in general? Uh, you know, I think in the near term, there's always uh, crazy fast money hedge fund traders that want to trade these things. Uh, at 2 p.m. yesterday, when the Fed put out their press release, the market sold off radically NASDAQ and Bitcoin, and they all dumped. And then uh, as Jerome Powell started talking by three o'clock, it rallied and raged forward. You know, and what you can see is that you know, people sort of want to read something into it and they're just running around, you know, chasing their tails, making fools of themselves in a way. And if you panicked and you panic sold, you lost some money and, you know, you panic buy, you know, you're just as, as caught up in the moment. Uh, let's, let's step back and look at the big picture. Um, the big picture is the, uh, the government CPI in the US is nearly 8%. That's the published number. The published producer price index is 10%. Um, the published CPI numbers in other countries are higher, as much as double or triple higher. All of the published numbers are manipulated to be the lowest figure you could possibly create via market basket adjustments and hedonic adjustments. So uh, if I talk to people that I know, they would say, well, real costs uh, for producers are going up 15% or 20%. So the PPI is 10, but the real number is 20. The CPI, they say, is 8, but the real number for many consumer things are 12 to 16. Um, the asset inflation rate is at least double the CPI. So if your goal is, you know, we know that the Case-Shiller index is showing about 18%. So middle middle class home is up 18% year over year. You talk to a lot of people in big cities that say like in Miami or New York or other places, they're up 20% or 25%. So the actual inflation rates on either assets or, or desirable goods are running probably double what the CPI is. Classic conventional wisdom would say that if the inflation rate was 8%, you need to raise interest rates to 8%. Well, the inflation rate's higher, the interest rates go into 25 basis points. So I don't think that raising interest at this level has any long-term impact. It has a near-term skittish trading impact. But, but even if you believed inflation was 8%, there's no way you can conclude that 25 to 200 basis points is gonna stop it. Um, the negative real yield on bonds, if you calculate it, must be running minus 15%. Yep. Uh, the, the swap curve is flat. It's like, I think yesterday, uh, three-year treasury swaps were 226 basis points and 30-year treasury swaps were 229 basis points. Yep. That, that means that in theory, somebody wants to, wants to pay you 2.3% interest for money for the rest of your life. And the inflation rate's running eight to 15% right now, which means that the negative yield is minus 12, 13, 14%, which means that under the best of circumstances, the half-life of, uh, of your money stored in sovereign debt is five years. And it's gonna be cut in half twice in the next 10 years, but probably worse than that. So, you know, when I look at this, what I think is 
none of the monetary policy is going to stop the problem of asset inflation. It's probably not going to stop CPI and PPI inflation either. And the other important point to make is I, I think most people misunderstand inflation and they misunderstand the cause of inflation as well. And they misunderstand what money is. The, the thing they misunderstand about inflation is it's, it's completely a vector. There's, there's, there's 10,000 different numbers and you need to calculate your own market basket of desirable products. And, and the de desirable market basket should be assets, products, and services that you want in the location you intend to live. When you do that, you'll find that the, the real inflation rate is probably triple, double to triple what the, what the CPI is published in any given country. It doesn't matter whether it's Argentina or Venezuela or Turkey or the US. It's, it's generally always double to triple. You can tell it always has been. For example, the US inflation rate nominally for 100 years is about 2%. But in fact, we know that the US dollar lost 99.5% of its value. Yep. So if you back solve, you can calculate that the real monetary inflation rate has been about 8 to 9% for 100 years. It hasn't ever been 2%. And so you're deluding yourself to think that. So that, mm -hmm. that's the first problem people have, the misnomer. And the second misnomer is, is and this comes from, uh, you know, quoting Milton Fried, Friedman without thinking too hard. People just, they quote bromides, but they don't think very hard about it. Friedman said, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. And people think they're smart when they say that. But if you thought about it a bit, you would realize that it's, it sounds good. It sounds revolutionary. It's not even true. Inflation is not everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Inflation is substantially or partly a monetary phenomenon. If I double the amount of money or the, or the currency in, the, in a system, if I double it, I will get inflation. If I increase it by a factor of 100, I'll definitely get inflation. That's not in dispute. But now here's the big question. Can I create inflation without increasing the currency supply? And the answer is yes. If you thought about it for even a minute, if I pass a law making it illegal for anybody to work in the country, and if you need people working to create products, will the supply of products go up or down? down. <laughs> if the supply, of, if I make it illegal to create food, or if I, if I drive up the cost of labor, or if I put a tariff or shut down on the economy for a year, <laughs> or if I shut down the economy, right, for a year, or if I shut down the ports or the airports, or I, I, I stop the railroads, or I cease the shipping, or if I refuse to import oil from a country I don't agree with. All of those things are non-monetary phenomena, they're policy. So tax policy, labor policy, healthcare policy, economic policy, foreign policy, domestic policy, Substantially, everything the government does is inflationary. Hmm. Everything. And even hmm. if they don't increase the currency supply, they'll create inflation. So coming back to your question, if we had 8% inflation and you believed it, and if I raised the interest rates to 8% tomorrow, would I stop the inflation? And the answer is no, not as long as there's government because everything the government does, every policy they have with intent to do good creates inflammation in the economy and inefficiency and thereby contracts the supply, right? And creates inflation, drives up the prices, right? When we reshore all of the semiconductor fab facilities yep. from Taiwan to Pennsylvania or Ohio, and then we hire unionized labor to work in the facility, and then when we stop buying from the low cost provider in Taiwan, how is that not gonna drive up the price of chips? And how is that not gonna drive up the price of everything that has a chip in it? It's going to, right? And when we hire all those people, how is that not gonna drive up the price of labor for everyone else that needs those people, right? These are all inflationary policies having nothing to do with money. So ultimately, you know, I, I think that the conclusion is inflation is much higher than you thought it was. And uh, the sources of inflation are from a dozen different places, all of them generally related to public policy, every policy, you know, energy policy, you know, 
you want to get all your energy from solar panels, right? That drives up the price of energy. Every single policy yeah. conceivable drives inflation. The more government you have, the more inflation you have. As the government increases its scope, the sco as the scope of government increases, the scope of the currency supply increases, as well as the scope of regulation, thereby impairing the production of goods and services, creating more scarcity, driving up price, uh, undermining market systems that would otherwise attempt to clear the market by, by matching supply and demand. But how do you match supply and demand if the supplies in China and the demands in the US and there's a tariff, right? Sitting between the two, you can't match the yep. supply and the demand. So the conclusion is, right? None of these policies are gonna stop inflation. Inflation will continue. And you know, even if I had the ability to change every single government policy on earth for every country, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not likely uh, that I can affect all those things overnight. So I, I would say that you're, you're better off served looking for a way to protect your own life savings yep. through a proper investment strategy, right? You can probably save yourself. Maybe you can save your company or your institution or do some good for your family, right? If you run a country, you can do things that are better for the country or worse for the country but kind of hard to stop the dynamic because, because it's so, I don't know, uh, widespread, right? In, yeah. in the culture. And that right there is exactly why we, our vision statement at the channel and at our company is to help people achieve financial sovereignty. And what we mean by that is helping people take back control of their financial systems, of their financial destiny, and of their finance tool, the currency and their assets itself, because we didn't tell people, we didn't go and tell, hey, government, we'd like to see half of all of the dollars printed, be printed in the last two years and inflate the currencies. We, we, the only way to stop the government from, as you said, everything it does causing inflation, the only way to stop that is to take their ability to cause inflation in the first place away from them in some sly roundabout way. And I think Bitcoin is the first way that we've ever done that. And that's why I believe that Bitcoin is the tool that we can use to achieve that financial sovereignty. And I think you just outlined exactly why Bitcoin needs to exist in the first place, because the government causes that inflation. And that is slowly and subtly stealing from the wealth of everyone who uses those currencies. So, Michael, I want to be respectful of your time. If you have any final thoughts, please let us know, but I want to let you go. I know you're a very busy man. Yeah, well, thanks for me ha having me on the show. Yeah. And, uh, and I enjoyed our conversation, and uh, I wish everybody the very best in their pursuits going forward. Michael, I am inspired by your story and all of the interviews I've watched with you, and it has been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. I hope we get to do it again, and I still love that ship. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you very much, Michael. Take it easy. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, you should definitely consider subscribing because we're trying to help you become financially free in these cryptocurrency markets. And also, consider following us on Twitter, at CryptoJeb, for more updates on the price of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Peace.